title of the message today, though, is The Ephesian Tragedy. The Ephesian Tragedy. The book of Ephesians, I've mentioned before on more than one occasion, the book of Ephesians, I've mentioned before on more than one occasion, is been dubbed by some to be the crown jewel of all the Pauline epistles, if you please. It reveals a breadth and depth of the Father's love for us through Christ by the Holy Spirit. It is a tremendously profound letter. Paul not only teaches us about our identity in Christ, but he points out that this identity is best understood when we are together working as a unified community we call the church. In this letter, Paul presents the mystery of the gospel using the term mystery, in fact, even six different times. Now, in this letter, Paul states some of the most powerful and sublime truths of the Bible. He writes about salvation by grace through faith, for example, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in then. Now, Tammy, you help me out if I miss one. I missed a, a, a text last week, and, and, I, and, and Sherry helped me to catch it when we were doing a video editing. And I said, well, the problem was Tammy wasn't here last week in person. She's online with us, and Tammy usually helps me on this, and I, I really need that help sometimes. So, Tammy, you don't be afraid to get in there and correct me. Because the Word of God should be read right. Amen? And if I make a mistake, woe well unto me. But the Word of God is precious to us, and it deserves a good, proper reading. Well, another beautiful text is in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. I mentioned Paul speaks about the mystery of God and the mystery of the will of God in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. In the book of Ephesians, we read about Christ indwelling in our hearts by faith and our comprehending the love of God. In Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts, how? By faith. That ye being rooted and grounded, in, and by the way, by faith. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing the word of God. Christ dwells in your heart through the word of God. It says, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and even the height. He puts in four dimensions here. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. In this epistle, Paul also speaks about the truth of the one true God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, he says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Amen. Paul speaks a great deal in Ephesians chapter 4 about spiritual gifts, right? Starting in verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, you, know, you get an idea here that Paul is just sort of covering a little bit of everything, isn't he? He's really laying out. He talks about personal relationships. In Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27, he says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Friends, when we allow anger and bitterness to dwell in us, we are giving place to the devil. Amen? Well, 
He had one for me here, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, he also wrote about the wives and things they do, but I can't go through every verse in Ephesians today, can I? But just a couple more. Ephesians 6.4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and ammunition of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6, we have the armor of God portrayed. Put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he goes on to speak about the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, and so on. You can begin to see that while, for instance, the book of Romans and the book of Galatians are known for their salvational themes, Ephesians has this and much more. No wonder it is the crown jewel, if you please, the Grand Canyon of Paul's writings. I'd like to share with you three, four, five references from the Spirit of Prophecy where she talks a little bit about the church at Ephesus, the church that Paul was writing here to. This is from Manuscripts and Letters 21, Manuscript 11 of 1906. This church had been highly favored, speaking about the church at Ephesus. In the same city was the temple of Diana, which in point of grandeur, was one of the marvels of the world. You know, you know, it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, they called it. The Ephesian church met with great opposition, and some of the early Christians suffered persecution. So this was a church that, that was in a, a, a center of heathenism, and it suffered persecution. In volume six of the Testimonies, on page 421, in paragraph two, at the first, the experience of the church at Ephesus was marked with childlike simplicity and fervor. A lively, earnest, heartfelt love for Christ was expressed. The believers rejoiced in the love of God because Christ was in their hearts as an abiding presence. The praise of God was on their lips, and their attitude of thanksgiving was in accord with the thanksgiving of the heavenly family. And then continuing and the next paragraph of volume six on page 421. The world took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if the world would take knowledge of us because we have been with Jesus. Amen. Sinful men, repentant, pardoned, cleansed, and sanctified were brought into partnership with God through his son. Amen. The believers sought earnestly to receive and obey every word of God. Filled with love for their Redeemer, they sought as their highest aim to win souls to Him. They did not think of hoarding the precious treasure of the grace of Christ. They felt the importance of their calling and waited with the message, peace on earth, goodwill to men. They burned with desire to carry the glad tidings to the earth's remotest bounds. This is the church at Ephesus. And then this also, continuing, the next paragraph. The members of the church were united in sediment and action. It was a united church. Love for Christ was the golden chain that bound them together. They followed on to know, know the Lord more and still more perfectly, and brightness and comfort and peace were revealed in their lives. They visited the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and kept themselves unspotted from the world. A failure to do this would, in their view, have been a contradiction of their profession and a denial of their Redeemer. Now, we understand that Ephesians was written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. It would have been written, it's one of what we call the... the um, the prison epistles that would have been written at about the same time as Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul, we know, had spent about three years in fruitful ministry in Ephesus, and no doubt he had made very many intimate friends there. And yet, unlike Romans, there's no personal greetings in this epistle. It is an epistle written with a, a, a a viewpoint of being very broad. It's, it's a universal epistle that can apply certainly to the whole church, the universal church. Yet I want you to notice what Paul writes near the beginning of his letter in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And this sort of confirms what we just read in Spirit of Prophecy about their experience. It says, 
Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. But it's that part in verse 15, and love unto all the saints. Here was a church that was known for its love to all the saints. What does that mean? Well, in this text, Paul uses the, the Greek word, Agape, or sometimes pronounced agape, depending on where you put the syllables at. And it says, it's this godly love that you had for each other. Not just any love, but agape love. To truly love the brethren with a godly love, friends, you must love God first. Amen? In 1 John chapter 4, and verses 20 and 21, John writes, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So they loved the brethren. That meant that they loved God. Here's just a few more verses along this line. In 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the Brethren, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Friends, that's a very powerful statement to consider. If we cannot love our brothers or sisters, if we harbor bitterness and hatred toward our brothers and sisters, I'm not telling you you abide in death, but the scripture, according to John, under inspiration, says that you are. And Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because you go to church on Saturday and you don't eat meat. Is that what it says? Is it right to go to church on Saturday? Is it a good thing to abstain from flesh foods? Yeah, those are good things, right? But Jesus said this, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Oh, this is the hallmark of our Christianity. It really is so important. Well, let's continue in volume six of the testimonies and let's read a little bit more on page 422 in paragraph two. But after a time, the zeal of the believers, their love for God and for one another began to wane. Coldness crept in to the church. Differences sprang up to a church whose epistle dwelt much upon the unity in Christ. I, I put that in so you could see that that's, Important to understand. Differences sprang up, and the eyes of many were turned from beholding Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith. The masses that might have been convicted and converted by a faithful practice of the truth were left unwarned. Then it was that the message was addressed to the Ephesian church by the true witness. Oh, there's more than, isn't there? John, who spent a good deal of time in Ephesus, Ephesus was, became, as it were, his home base. When he got the revelation on the island of Patmos, the message to the first church was the message to the church at Ephesus. It must have really meant something to John to hear that message. Well, let's look at that message in Revelation chapter 2. It's the first of the seven churches listed. So let's read the message. It's only seven verses long. Verses 1 and 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Now remember, he's writing to the angels. The angel of the church at Smyrna, to the angel of the church at Pergamos. And the angels represent the leaders of those churches. And of course, John at one time was a leader of that church, wasn't he? It must have really meant something to John to hear this. What's he going to say about this? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. This is good. This is good. Sounds like a pretty good church. Verse 3 and 4. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. 
If you look in the text itself in your Bible, the word somewhat is italicized. Do you see that? That probably shouldn't be there because it almost diminishes the rebuke. It softens the rebuke. He says, I have something against you. You left your first love. This word left in the Greek is a fiamy, and it means not just simply to leave something, but to send away. To send away something. And you've sent away your first love. And in the Greek, thy first love is expressed very emphatically with the article, article repeated, thy love, thy first love, thy first one. It's quite a stinging rebuke. But he has hope for the church. In verse 5, he says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. He says, you've fallen. This is not just a church that's having a little rough time. It's a church that's fallen. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now I want you to notice here that the people to whom these words were addressed, they had many excellent qualities. And they're recognized by the true witness. They cannot bear evil. They don't accept false apostles. They have labored in working for their master, and they've even patiently endured. It reminds you a little bit of Revelation 14, 12, the patience of the saints, right? Yet Jesus says that he has something against them. Not even somewhat, but there's something against you here. Something so great that they will be weighed in the balances of the heavenly sanctuary and found wanting if this situation is not reversed. Here is a want that will have to be supplied. They have left their first love. All the other graces fell to make up this deficiency. The church is counseled to remember, therefore from whence it has fallen and repent and do the first works, or else Jesus says, I'm going to come to you. And he says, not only am I going to come to you, I'm going to come to you quickly. And I'm going to remove the candlestick, except you repent. And friends, this means very simply that unless this situation again is remedied, they are going to be lost. A church that once had great love for God, great love for one another. And again, what was the fatal deficiency they had? They have left their first love. Well, this couldn't be our problem, could it? God's church today wouldn't have any problem like this, would it? You know, we can, beyond a doubt, we can prove our doctrines are correct. We don't like evil. We don't like false doctrines. We don't like false prophets. We labor against them. But friends, even if we put all of our energy into this, this is not enough. Not at all. Friends, what is our motive? Why are we called to upon to repent? Jesus says you've left your first love. But what is this first love? Love. Now, the Greek word for love here is the same word that we saw in Ephesians 1 that's translated love there, agape or agape, that godly, self-sacrificing love. But it says you've left your first love. And you know that word first is a very interesting word. Uh, according to the text, the Greek word we translate first is protos. And lexicons give various meanings to it. But firstly, it means the idea of being numerically first to be uh, to being first in sequence, inclusion of time, set number, space. In other words, for example, in Acts 20 and verse 18, it says, And when they came to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first protest day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. In other words, it means like the first one in order, first. The first thing that happened on the first day God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? It can mean that. But that's not all it can mean. Secondly, it carries the idea of 
preeminence or first or foremost or most important or most preeminent, most prominent. Like you go to the county fair and you look for the first fruits. The first fruits get the blue ribbon. They're not necessarily the first fruits that were placed on the table numerically, but they were the best, right? And we see examples of this, for example, in Mark 12 and 29, where Jesus said the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is the preeminent commandment of all. In Matthew 20 and verse 27, Jesus said, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. But the word we translate chief here is also translated first in Revelation 2.7. I'm sorry, Revelation 2.4. It's protos. It's this word that means first, or it can mean chief, preeminent among you. Also in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says that Christ came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief or first. He wasn't the first sinner numerically, was he? But Paul looked upon himself as the chief of all sinners, or as the greatest, the most preeminent of all sinners. So sometimes this word is used in such a way that it refers to both. And in our religious experience, Christ is to be first numerically, and he is to be first in eminence too. He is to be first in every respect. We are to love him first, and we are to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But how do we lose our first love? What brought about this Ephesian tragedy, if you please? Well, first of all, I want to tell you, friends, it doesn't happen overnight. It's very few couples that get married on Tuesday and have a divorce on Wednesday. Just usually doesn't work like that. But friends, like the Ephesian brethren, we can take our eyes off Jesus, but think they're still upon Jesus because we are studying the doctrines we're so focused upon the doctrines and protecting the flock from false apostles, we can even be so intent upon preaching the last warning message to the world that we can forget to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Our eyes are on other things, even good things, but not upon Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, we are told that we should be looking unto Jesus, the author of and the finisher of our faith. Now, author means the beginning, the finisher, the perfecting, the one who brings it to maturation. In other words, every point of our experience, we should be looking to Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And verse 3 says, for consider him. Consider not a fleeting thought, friends. Consider, meditating, praying, studying. For consider him that endured such contradiction, the Greek word means hostility, of sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in your minds. Your whole being becomes tired. And you know, that famous coach Vince Lombardi, he said one time, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Think about that. Whenever you're really tired, is it easy to be irritable? Is it easy to give up? Is it easy to not be quite as strong as before? We don't want to be weird in our minds, friends, above all things. Now, what are some of the symptoms of losing our first love? Sometimes in taking time to study and pray, we are sleeping in. Or maybe we're hurrying off to the job. Even good things. I've got printing in the office to do today. We're printing the Old Paz magazine. We need to get that thing out. There's a lot to do today. Let's get at it. Instead of telling others of Jesus and witnessing, we become more quiet and reserved with those chances to witness to new people, especially when it happens. We go along depending upon a prior experience thinking that we are still Christians. That experience that has served us so well in the past, friends, to help us to detect false teachings and to know the truth from the false apostles has been so good to us in the past. But friends, 
to keep our own experience vibrant and living today. That experience has failed us and will fail you. Because you need a new experience each day with Christ. You need to be connected to the living source. The branch must stay connected to the vine. In Selected Messages in Book 1 on page 370 in paragraph 3, Oh, that the church might realize its need of its first adder of love. When this is wanting, all other excellences are insufficient. The call to repentance is one that cannot be disregarded without what? Peril. A belief in the theory of the truth is not enough. To present this theory to unbelievers does not constitute you a witness for Christ. The light that gladdened your heart when you first understood the message for this time is an essential element in your experience and labors, and this has been lost out of your heart and life. Christ beholds your lack of zeal and declares that you have fallen and are in a perilous position. Now, if you notice at the beginning of the statement, she speaks about this first ardor of love. And that word means enthusiasm or passion. Some synonyms for it include fervor, zeal, wholeheartedness, eagerness, intensity, zest, gusto, energy, animation, fire, emotion, etc. That's what we've lost. You know, we don't get excited about it anymore. But we ought to be. We ought to be. In 1888, in 1888, God sent to this people a special message. A special message that in some ways really was more about having this first love experience continue in our lives than anything else. We, we talk about the 188 message that Jones and Wagner brought to the church. But friends, this message that they gave, it was designed to keep the church, maybe I should say it was designed to bring back to the church its first love experience that it had lost. Because doctrinally, if you look at the doctrines, they were correct. The expositions were magnificent. The logic was correct. But I want you to notice in Revelation 14, and the first angel's message, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7 here, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, oh, we're going to be sharing some good news here. Good news. That's what the gospel is, right? Good news. The good news is about getting saved, right? Oh, maybe. Let's read on. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water and says nothing about going and getting saved. It doesn't say anything about turning your life over to Jesus. The first thing that the, this gospel is to do is to bring honor and glory to God, to bring reverence to God. And friends, when you do that and you share that with people, they will start to get converted. But our, our, our presentation of the gospel has become so egocentric Here's your problem. You need to get saved. We should be telling people about God. To fear God and to give glory to Him. So there is this message to preach the everlasting gospel to every nation, kin, and tongue, and people. Again, it's a message to fear Him. And we know that this, this, uh, this message, it speaks about the fourth commandment, doesn't it? It most certainly does. But friends, that means nothing unless we are in a fellowship with the one who gave that commandment. In other words, before we evangelize the world, friends, we have to be at one with God ourselves. So what we need to understand is that there is a remedy. Amen.
There is a remedy. Jesus holds out the remedy for our lukewarmness. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. We need to understand and accept that we are fallen, that all is not well with us. Oh, I know. We can recite the Ten Commandments verbatim. We learned them when we were six years old. And when we were 13, we learned the three angels' messages by heart. We maybe even learned to sing Isaiah 53 all the way through as a scripture song. But friends, our love may be gone. We are to remember. Now, to remember is to compare your present state with your former state and to consider how much better it was at one time and be willing to admit that. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, and I'll read this slower, it says, Examine yourselves. I like to examine my brother better. I like to examine my wife better. She makes more mistakes than I do. You know, or whoever. Examine yourselves. In what way? How, Paul? Whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Either he's in us or he's not, friends. And if he's not in us, he says we are. Oh, that's a hard word. We don't want to be reprobates, do we? He tells us to remember. To think about the peace. The strength. The purity and the pleasure that you've lost. That you've lost by leaving your first love. To think about how much more in former times you could comfortably lay down and sleep and have the assurance of peace than you have now. To think about how much better you could bear afflictions and how much more becomingly you could enjoy the favors of providence, even when it didn't seem so sweet. How much easier even the thoughts of death might appear to you then than they do today. How much stronger your desires and hopes for heaven were then. Jesus says, and remember, Jesus is the faithful and true witness. He says that you must repent. That means you must be grieving inwardly and ashamed of your sinful backsliding, and you must accept the blame and shame for yourself and humbly confess it in the sight of God and turn around, because repentance means to turn around. Turn around. You must return and do your first, first works. You must, as it were, begin again, go back step by step till you come to the place that you took your first step, and you must endeavor to revive and recover your first zeal that you had. You must pray as earnestly, watch as diligently, study as thoroughly, not just study to prove a doctrine right, but study to find Christ. Too often we preach about doctrines. We even preach about Christ and we don't preach Christ himself. We don't study Christ. Friends, unless we understand that we are fallen and remember from whence we have fallen and repent and do the first works, our candlestick will be removed because God is no respecter of persons, right? Well, what would that mean to us? It would mean the loss of eternal salvation, the loss of eternal salvation. Yet Jesus commends the Ephesians for an important thing in Revelation 2, 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? Well, Histor historically, we are told that they were a heretical sect that plagued the churches at Ephesus, and also we read on in Pergamos. And Arrhenus identifies the Nicolaitans as a Gnostic sect, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was that the gospel of Christ releases men from the law of God. It has no effect. By believing, they claim that they are released from the necessities of being doers of the word. But is this what the Bible teaches? Is this what Paul himself said? No. In Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? He's been speaking about faith. Do we make void the law through faith? The answer is God 
forbid. Yea, we what? Establish the law. We establish the law. So you see, true faith, which works by what? Love. And purifies the soul, friends, doesn't get rid of the law of God at all. But you know, we can be zealous for the law of God, but not have love, can't we? Were the Jews zealous for the law of God in their days? Very zealous, weren't they? But we do need the law of God, absolutely. Romans 6, 1 and 2. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we? He answers very emphatically, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to what? Sin live any longer therein. Now, according to 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. So if we are truly under grace, how shall we that are dead to, to, to breaking the commandments of God live any longer therein? Well, we don't. So love brings us into obedience to the word of God. In John chapter 14, and verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. So what happened to Ephesus? What happened to Ephesus? Ephesus was a marvel of a city at one time. It had one of the most advanced aqueduct systems in the ancient world with at least six aqueducts of various size supplying different areas of the city. They fed a number of water mills, one of which has been identified as even a sawmill for marble, for cutting up marble. Ephesus also had several major bath complexes. It was a busy harbor. It was the home of the Temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the home of the Library of Celsus. Uh, here is the uh, part of the library you see, and if you look at the top, you're going to see uh, part of the facade that had been rebuilt from uh, broken down stones that were in the area. It had one of the uh, largest amphitheaters in the world at the time. And it was supposedly, as we mentioned, the home of John for many years. And there's a tomb there that is claimed to be the tomb of the Apostle John. That was Ephesus. However, the river, a canster that came through Ephesus out to the sea, eventually silted out the harbor and it became useless, uh, resulted in big marshes. There was a lot of malaria and many deaths among the inhabitants. And finally, the site was abandoned. Today, Ephesus is simply a stop on the tour bus. Now, some early church documents seem to suggest that at the end of that first century that there were Christians in Ephesus who heeded the message of Revelation and got back their first love. But we know at the end, the city came to naught. There's not a Christian one in that area today. I can't tell you that a candlestick was removed. I don't know. The Ephesian tragedy is not some Aristotelian tragedy, but a real event in the lives of the people and maybe in our lives today. Maybe in our lives today, if we have left our first love. But must this happen to us? Like virtually every problem we have as believers, Calvary is the answer. Remember, we read Hebrews 12, 3 earlier, where it says, for consider, and that word consider in the Greek is an imperative. It means it's something you must do. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. In other words, we should spend thoughtful time every day contemplating Calvary and the cross of Christ. And Calvary testifies to you of the value of a soul, how valuable you are to God. But not just you. How valuable your children are. Good. Our children are pretty valuable to us. How valuable your parents are to you if they're still living by God's grace. It's pretty important. How valuable anyone else is to you. But friends, also. Also, how valuable your worst enemy is to the side of God. How valuable is your worst enemy? Well, in the book, Christ Object Lessons, 
on page 196 in paragraph 4. I think you have all have read this statement before, but let's read it again. The value of a soul, who can estimate? Question mark. Would you know its worth? Go to Gethsemane, and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish, when he sweat as it were great drops of blood, look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross, hear that despairing cry, what? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark fifteen thirty four. Look upon the wounded head, consider it, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember that Christ risked all. Remember in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the government shall be upon his shoulders. He would bear the responsibility of the government of God, the stability of the universe would be upon his shoulders. He risked everything for that soul that you hate the most. For the soul you hate the most. That's what Jesus thinks of that person. For our redemption, heaven itself was imperiled. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life, you may estimate the value of a soul. And the soul that you must first estimate is your own soul. What the Father and the Son have done for you, and to get yourself in line so that you can give glory to God and bring reverence to him. You see, the love of God is clearly expressed at Calvary the most. And this principle, found in 1 John 4, 19, then goes into effect, which says that we love him because he first loved us. In other words, love begets love. And his love and the demonstration of his love is what actuates us to love, to get that first love, to regain that first love, and to keep that first love experience. Friends, if we have left our first love, it's because ultimately we've lost sight of Calvary. and We've lost sight of his love for us. So let us gain a new view of Calvary. As it says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is what God is offering to each one of us today. To either get for the first time that first love experience, or to retain it, or to remember where we've fallen, to repent, to do the first works, to come back into that first love experience and serve Him today. God is calling you. God is calling you today to remember, to repent, and to do those first works. He wants you to be saved in his kingdom. You know, this really, in many respects, is an equivalent. I'm not saying it's equal, but it's an equivalent to buying gold tried in the fire and putting on the white raiment and having the eyes of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what we need today. And we can, we can deny it's needed. We can say, well, you know, it's talking about someone else, not talking about me. But may I remind you, and I remind myself, I try never to preach a message that doesn't apply to me in some way. This is said by the faithful and true witness. And he doesn't make mistakes. But he holds out to us, he holds out to us, friends, the promise that we read there earlier in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. If we could just go back there one more time. I don't have a slide for it, but if we go back to Revelation 2, 7. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So instead of being fallen and eternally lost, we can eat of the tree of life and have immortality and blessedness with God through all of eternity. We have two choices, don't we? Ultimately, we have two choices. Doesn't seem like a very good choice on one side, and the other side seems like a very good choice to me. What do you think? Is that, are you with me on that? Amen? Is that the choice you want? Amen? Oh, friends, that's what I want. That's what I want for you. 
And may God bless each one of you, friends, lots and lots and lots. <laughs>